So this is my honest review of the Chesapeake Lightcraft Teardrop Camper. Now before I start this review and how I feel or my opinion of such review, please understand that the original vision for this camper is to be as light as possible. They want you to be able to tow this with just about any car you can. <clears throat> Now, to be honest with you, yes, I've actually been towing it with a Chevrolet Volt for quite a while. I've actually had this hooked to my car for roughly about 15,000 miles, or almost 20,000 miles. And it's been on there for about the last six months, and I've just not disconnected it. I take it with me just about everywhere when I go shopping, and it's been a nice little storage unit. We've taken it out camping several times, but uh, definitely keep in mind about their original vision and what they wanted this camper to be. Now, as I start, I will go over some of the things that I believe are uh, uh, limiting factors that might be important to some others, and some good aspects about the camper as well. Now, the reason it took me so long to be able to make this video is, sorry one for one, they, I've got some noisy dogs as neighbors and they can get really loud sometimes. Two, the weather has been really bad here in Florida for a while, and so it's been rainy constantly. And three, it's been really hard to be able to come up with what my opinion has been on this camper. Now, many of you may not know, but I actually had a pretty bad experience when trying to purchase this camper that supposedly led to somebody being let go or fired from the company. And some problems over email and securing the camper. and. After almost Google uh, reviews coming to my rescue, which still allowed a transaction to be able to happen, and some pretty hard feelings left over from that, I still actually have to personally say I actually recommend this camper. I actually believe it's a nice little kit. Uh, you can learn a lot from how stitching glue works and learn a lot of new techniques. And as many of you guys know, some of my old timers, uh, that I am a jack of all trades. You guys know I can build and do just about anything. And I still actually had a lot to learn from this camper. Now with that being said, some of the drawbacks of the camper I think can be fixed. I think uh, some of the issues that they're having, uh, I know that they're trying to make it as light as possible or and also a low entry point for cost. So a lot of the things that can be fixed would actually kind of add cost to the camper. So only they know what's best, what sells, and what's working best. Now, since this is something that you get as a kit, and going into it, you can go, well, maybe I can fix that, or maybe I can do this a little bit differently, and that's exactly how I got, got into it. So yes, I did, halfway through the book, start deviating from how they wanted to construct the kit. So, one of the main areas that I wish could be different, but I understand, is the clearance in the bed area. Now, I'm the type of person who actually has to take my leg and help myself roll over in the middle of the night. And as you can see, there is not hardly any clearance whatsoever after you add about a three inch mattress uh, with a bed clearance. My second issue going into uh, this little camper is the construction of the doors. I think they're cute, but they need a lot more beef up and I believe a few steps in the kit made it a lot more difficult. Um, there's so many steps that if they just slightly go awry a little bit, you get sometimes a really bad gap underneath this door. And it was one of the primary reasons why I went to the showroom and actually wanted to pick this camper up. Now as you can see, I still suffered and still have troubles getting that door to seal. Now there's actually some tricks and things that I learned and I got it a lot better. I literally had a gap there that was so large I could stick my hand through it. And that was before any latches or anything were put on there. And so I have some tips and techniques for that. Two, there is a lot of play in that door. The type of hardware that they use and everything on the side here has lots of play in here. So I actually 3D printed some parts and we'll be going over that here shortly on how to take up a lot of that slack in that door. And as you can see, the door closes pretty nicely. This is how it meets up before I start to latch it. 
and then my finger matches pretty nicely. So now let's go over some of the reasons why I believe that complications can make these doors pretty difficult to create. So what the I'm doing this based off of memory and the kit, but if I remember correctly, as we're sitting in our mold upside down, there actually is a couple of tie points in this area. And what they're trying to do is they're trying to round the camper this direction, but it also rounds all of your doors and everything this direction. So the first thing I would definitely recommend is as it's rounded here, they want you to install these door seals through here that clamp and all of a sudden it takes this roundness right here and it straightens it out. Well, as it starts to straighten it out, it starts to bow out the underneath of our door. Another complication that we have is since the outside of the camper is fiberglass and two layers of six ounce, what you get is when you get several layers of fiberglass on this thin Luan or this marine grade plywood, as it expands, it wants to warp up. And there's no fiberglass on this. I'm just using this as a, as a uh, reference. But as the, the wood starts to expand, but the fiberglass can't, it starts to warp up more. Now, since I was building this in the Florida weather uh, in a uh, car tent, uh, I knew that was going to be an issue uh, out of other things. So what I did is I actually came behind the door with three ounce. And let's see, I'm not sure if you can actually see it. You can also see some carbon fiber there. But I actually came in here with three ounce fiberglass and I did two layers on the inside, which helped keep that warp from happening, right? So you can see I'm kind of a little bit thick in this area, but there, that was to help that warp as it's set in the weather. Now the doors actually fit absolutely perfect. Now there was, if I would have known what was going to happen still, I would have actually done another step. So here is the fix for fixing these doors. When you're at the step where your camper is upside down in the mold, um, right where you see where they use the CNC machine to cut these little curves out and all that, take you a little piece of dowel, no, not a dowel rod, but a piece of hardwood. Now this is some pretty hard stuff. And what you do is since you're using your, your stitch and glue method, take your blue tape or your aluminum tape. Everybody knows I love using aluminum tape because it's a better non-stick to fiberglass. And you can literally go in these particular lines and from the uh, outside, you go ahead and safety wire a piece of wood here, down here as well, the same thing over here and right here. You don't need to worry about the top or the bottom. What you're doing is you're pulling this in completely flush through here from the inside or actually from the outside. Now you don't have to worry about your wire. You can leave your wire there. I'm sorry. You want to twist your wires from the outside and you don't have to worry about you know the little holes are going to be left because obviously they're going to be in your door jam now what you do is on the inside you can take at least one layer of six ounce two layers of three ounce which still equals the six now i like the three ounce aircraft cloth and you go ahead and you do the whole inside parameter of the door now i'll show you some pictures of where i've done that at and it does overlap so my fiberglass goes from all the way here to here now, when that is done and it hardens all the way, you now have it completely straight and a thin layer of fiberglass. You can't even see my fiberglass in here. I mean, so it's not gonna, you know, show anything. Now, the moment you get ready to install your door jam, this is all flat and the door is flat. So after that's hardened, you just go ahead and cut these loose and then you're ready to fiberglass the outside of the door. Our issue that we're having is because this is curved here, and the construction because we have I think a wire tie right here pulling that again the moment that you make this a straight line you make this a straight line then the door gets kicked out now I still had the door kick out issue and I will also explain how I fixed that but I hope you guys got the gist of how to get this straight before you start to fiberglass the outside of the camper at all so let me show you how to fix the uh, if the door is curved Okay, so this is the order of how I did it. So after you get the inside lip on the inside of this door, fiberglass, I went ahead and cut out the door, and I went ahead and cut out window seal. Then I went ahead and installed the uh, inside door trim. 
Now for me, since I didn't have this all flat, no, I needed to, and I was like, I knew there was a little bit of curve and I tried to match this curve by sanding into this, which also led to another problem, but I'll get back to it. Uh, if you've got this all straight, then you don't really, and the door fits okay after you get this step done, then you won't have to worry about the other steps that I had to do. But if your door is starting to show that it's kicking out in the bottom absolutely flush, this store jam is perfect to use to help get all this back in line. So two popsicle sticks, if you take a popsicle stick and you cut it and you double layer up and you use a little CA glue and you put it right here, it is the exact distance to keep this door absolutely flush. With the window cut out with nothing installed to the door yet, that is just nothing but its little panel, you can go ahead and come in here with your quick uh, squeezy clamps and you clamp this to two of you know four points here that's holding this guy flush now the bottom of your door is going to be kicked out what you do is if you've got one of these guys laying around as you can see this blade is really really thin so the trick that i did was i came in here and you can see this line let's see if you can see it i'm surprised the dogs didn't go nuts with that See that line all the way through there, but then you can't see it there, but now you can see it all the way through here. See it here? Well, that line doesn't show up very easily because it's so thin and it looks like it's back where it's supposed to be. So what I did is I used my vibrating tool. I came through here and I actually cut all the way plunge cut, but I left just a little bit there about the thickness of like two sheets of paper. Then plunge cut all the way through here. Now what that does is it holds everything square and all that, but it allows this to go in and out. So what I did is I pushed this in, just put a little tack of CA glue with a piece of a popsicle stick down here, then everything was perfect. And what I did was I started to push my fillet in backwards through here, then I let that harden. Then I came in here with two more layers of fiberglass, which you can't see. I mean, I still haven't serviced the outside of the camper, I still haven't done the clear coat, but the two layers of fiberglass here, with my carbon fiber that was here and then another two layers of six ounce, I now got my door a lot more perfect. Now the issue you're gonna find with these doors is they're just so weak. They're so one-handed. I mean, I can bend this door really easily. So what I did, and there'll still be more reinforcing to come, is I added this piece in here and these pieces were a lot easier to add once the door was closed to uh, get them absolutely perfectly centered. But I cut this off here and I made it meet another piece of hardwood coming all the way up to here. Now I was going to cut a little piece and get all this and I plan on double painting these windows and everything for in the winter. But uh, also there's a piece of insulation going here. That's why I'm not too worried about all that looking perfect and pretty. But uh, that's how that came out. The other thing is you can literally take your pinky and bend this wall. I mean, this wall is also very weak like the door. Again, they're trying to go light for loading and that kind of such thing. But because our door seal is so thick and they chose a really good door seal. I mean, this is very good quality door seal. It's a memory foam, but that also brings its own challenges and its own problems. So that is actually what is pushing your door out. So what it does, when you go to close the door, the seal is pushing here. So this kind of all twists and warps here because it's very weak. And your door hinge actually pulls out a little bit. So if you notice on almost every teardrop camper kit that they have, they've always got this little bit of this door sticking out. Another remedy to help with that is try, if you can, find the same brand, slightly thinner door seal. The seal is kind of really thick. The other thing you can do is in this lower area, Try to sand a little bit of this lip away. I left it because I wanted everything to fit perfect, but you can actually sand a little bit of this way to help with the pressure if you decide to also use this really thick door seal. Now again, there's only that much clearance in this door seal. It's the thickness of two popsicle sticks. But I guess they decided to keep this large door seal thickness because uh, everybody who makes a camper is slightly different and if a larger door seal works better for others, then I guess that helped fix a lot of the majority of the problems with the kits, I'm not sure. The other remedy that they have is they want you to take a strap and mount it from one point to the other and pull it tightly to act like a bow, which bows everything. Well, I don't like that because that intrudes inside the camper and there's already a little uh, less room in here. 
So the other issue that we have is after the door has been open for a while and this foam kind of comes back to its memory point, I'll show you guys on the other side what that does. So this door has been open for about 20 minutes and all these little points are actually set to keep the door flush and looking perfect. Now once this door jam expands and this door is so weak, I mean, I'm holding still, you guys can see how all this door twists. So we go to close the door and I push flush here. This stays out so far that the door will never close. That little pin isn't far enough in to be able to, to catch it. See that, that, that pin right there? So when you go to close, so what you have to do is you gotta take a hand and you gotta push in on the door. Now, if you just open and close that door really quickly, that door seal is still the shape. That door closes perfect every single time. So that's really our only problem area because we have a mounting point here, here, the door pins goes up here and down here in the latch. The only point we can't really suck this door in properly is this bottom, bottom corner. So again, if you can get a one size smaller door seal and if you need to sand a little bit in that area to take away from there, and if you have to do the little saw trick to help suck the door in, and when you add the wood, you can do it more. You can have it give a little bit more pressure. Uh, and I actually did have mine perfectly flush for a while there, but the foam just kept fighting the wood so much that it just eventually warped it out. That I think that is the area that uh, is most concerned. I think the CNC machine that they have, they could actually take a little bit out of that area and make it easier but then again if you actually had like your doors always come out like that i can understand why they'd want a bigger seal another thing that's not included in the kit which i think should be is definitely some of this 3m primer now what this stuff is is it's kind of you ever get stung by a wasp and you got the glass thing inside it and you break it that's exactly what this is but this is actually for uh, because i ran a sign shop for so long uh, this is a glue primer. Basically, it's like adding the sticky stuff on the back of a sticker. And what you do is, as you're done with this door and you're getting ready to add the seal, uh, what you do is one of these is enough to do both these doors. So you break it, and you go all around this door seal, and you put that really sticky coating on here, through here. And then you actually go ahead and put your door seal on there. Now, another reason for doing that is, again, it helps keep the seal stuck to that. And I've actually been in some freezing climates already to where these door seals actually try to freeze to the uh, door jam. Now, again, we have silicone sprays and things for that, but if it catches you in time off guard, you really want the seal to be stuck really good to this. So here is, uh, it's just called 94 Primer from 3M. Stuff works really good. And I would literally use this on all of your seals. It's really cheap on eBay too. I think you can get like three or four of these for like nine bucks on eBay. Okay, now next to the other thing. The bolts that they used uh, were really tiny. I don't know if my kit just happened to be different, but I obviously upgraded my size on my bolts. The other issue that was with this kit is these door uh, mechanisms right here. They have lots and lots of play in them. They don't fit correctly. I can understand that a lot of this stuff is off the shelf uh, parts. So I have some other video here I'm going to try to chop in here to understand how to fix that and how to add a three or six millimeter shim in here to make all this work perfect. There's a shim in there. So hopefully I can use some of that but I actually tried to take that video in the rain. So uh, hopefully this next part of the video works out okay. So this threaded rod is inserted and they just drill kind of a hole through there at the factory and then put a pin in there and it gives room for play and wobble and all that. So again we take our 3D printed little piece right here and give it a little bit of a backer and where'd my nut go? There it is. And then we just tighten our nut down backwards. Now this has to be, you know, again you have to figure out your distance between here and here 
for your uh, door to actually clamp on. So by doing that, let me get that tightened up and then we'll see how much play that takes out of there. So you can do the same thing with washers or anything like that, but again, I 3D printed this part and as you can see, there is no longer any play in that. You, can't, you don't have to play Superman on it, but at least it does the job. So now there's no more back play right there. I can go ahead and insert that back into the door, put the screws in it, and keep assembling. So here's another uh, issue that we have to deal with. Now this is why I printed these little spacers right here. And they fit pretty snugly into the uh, handle right here because you can see they're pretty loose. But what happens is they stand so tall, sorry I'm trying to do this one handed, that the little clamp piece can't clamp properly. So when we'll put this guy on here and you want to tighten this nut down all the way, this piece is actually thicker sorry again for the this piece is actually thicker by quite a bit so what it does is it raises up so when you clamp down see how that's getting tight right there it wants to lock the door it doesn't want to rotate and pivot so what you could do if you really wanted to is you could grind some of this off and then polish it and make it just as thick as you need it but because we don't have much meat here and there I just decided to go ahead and print a spacer here which now this now adds distance to here and uh, now it gives me the distance that I need to be able to clamp that together. So let me get that together. And that's how they fit now. They're pretty tight. but I mean, they're not so tight that it messes with the latch. But it definitely takes all that play out of there. So again, because our pieces are a little bit thicker than, you know, what this piece can accept. When you tighten this down, again, it clamps this and makes it really hard to turn the the system and if you leave it too loose and this thing all comes apart you know, on your second day of camping uh, I printed this little spacer you probably could just use a washer underneath there but I just 3d printed one real quick and it just goes together like that and then this side's done so it works really nicely you see the little spacer there you see the spacer back there this doesn't, you know, move or wobble anymore. The other one did quite a bit. And that's it. So now we get to the part of the video for, uh, if you're still with me, you have purchased one of these campers or you're seriously thinking about purchasing it. So I'll go over some uh, options here and some things that I chose and did that uh, might help you decide which direction you want to go, how many of the components of the kit you would like to order, and so forth if you'd like to build it like mine or not. Now first, let me go get a tape ruler and let's talk about trailers. You have to decide what kind of trailer you wanna go with. Okay, so for me, I went the cheapest route possible. I ordered the full kit. Uh, as you see, there's no shipping on that and they had a special going on. So my kit with the fiberglass, uh, everything for just the body was $2,184. Now, there's actually a horror story that comes with that, and we'll talk about that later. But first, let me grab a tape ruler here, and this manual, and let's go over some stuff. Okay, so let's open the door here. And so, you've seen all the bays and everything that I had underneath the camper. Alright, so there's a decision that you need to make. Now, their particular kit allows them to move the tires to the outside of the trailer. You don't need that extra four inches that you would need for a Harbor Freight trailer for your fenders and the travel distance for the axle. If you order the trailer, you're able to lower it down. Now, if you order, they have another kit that's going underneath there that will raise the camper, I think, quite a bit. Now, the reason why we're talking about this is one, it'll give you options for the storage that you have underneath the trailer. And two, it tells you how far your door height is from the ground. Now let me pull out a tape ruler, and by choosing the Harbor Freight trailer, I'm sorry, bear with me, people. I am sitting, just my doorway, 25 and a half inches. And that is all the way to the ground, with the hitch sitting a little bit lower and not higher. So you can roughly say about 25 and a half. 
Now that extra four inches of travel by allowing the uh, tires to be underneath the camper allowed me to have all that storage room. And as you see, I dropped the water tank down that far. Yes, that's all fiberglass. It isn't open to the weather. So I literally, and there is a half an inch or three quarters inch worth of insulation. Now you can see because I chose the Harbor Freight trailer, I was able to cut it and modify it the way I wanted to. Now this trailer was definitely heavily modified. I removed a lot of the weight out of it. In fact, you can see over there, some of the metal beams, quite a bit of the beams and hardware for this trailer was removed. So I was able to get pretty light with this trailer. By also doing so, it left me with some extra steel that allowed me to one, mount my, uh, my uh, stabilizer jacks here. Slips down, slides down, and use the pipe to, and these will lift this all the way off the ground to change the tire. But it also allowed me to come back here and I used an aircraft style uh, bolt, as you can see, to uh, be able to install this full large drawer in here. Now you see this drawer is actually pretty big. And I just used these little 100 pound drawer glides that has the ability from side to side. This helps the drawer keep from going in crooked and jamming up. And as you can also see, I installed it on an incline. So as I push the drawer in, you see how the drawer raises up? Well, that raising up allows it to hit this rubber door seal. I think I uh, got this from a van. I think it was a Dodge Caravan. It's really soft, it's really... So when you go to close the drawer, there's actually a lip underneath here too. It's really hard to see. But the moment it passes this lip, as you can see, it's all the way up there. So it actually compresses up against her. And again, that's the same latch that's also used right here in the, in the latch. You can just get them out of any car trunk. But because of that, you can see... So the way we were able to get the power to pass through into the drawer here is well, I got some of these little spring-loaded... You see them in a van door whenever they want the door locks to work in a van or the power windows on a sliding door. You can get these uh, fairly easily off of eBay and such. And so I 3D printed a part over here to hold it just the right distance and everything from what I needed and I ran the wiring. And that's how I get power into my drawer. Now if I never, if the power doesn't work, as you see, this screw here is the center pin for the actual latch. So let's say I get a bad connection and there's something like that happens later down the road. I always keep this little bit with me, which I've never had a problem yet. And all you do is just unscrew this out, let it fall out, open the drawer, see what's going on. And uh, that, that's the way to be able to, to service the inside of the drawer. Well, this is what the inside of that looks like. Uh, I 3D printed this little cover right here because the spring uh, has uh, some... Sorry for all the noise. The springs come in this way, so they need an area to be protected. As you see, I only hooked up two of the wires here. And there's your normal little trunk latch again. As you see, I 3D printed all these parts. Uh, these guys have to be screwed down eventually. Uh, the stove actually has a little, these little corner thingies that hold it down in here. And I stuff a handful of, you know, utensils over here as well. But here's a close up of some of these parts printed. I just got to put the screws that go straight down and through those. You saw that had screw holes in it as well. And then my little plate holder. I'm, I'm going to keep making components here, but I want to leave enough room for like, you know, being able to put groceries in here and the whatnots. And, but so far it's turned out to be a pretty hefty little drawer. And that's how far it comes out. So as you're standing there, it doesn't have to be all the way out. So you can have it halfway out, grab things, set them up on the counter. And it's pretty easy for putting stuff up and getting stuff out. I was able to modify. I also moved the axle forward from the original Harbor Freight. So that axle is not where it's meant to be. Uh, another plus for using an all steel trailer 
will come up here, allowed me to actually weld metal guides to the frame to be able to hold the window AC unit in place there. That is a 5,000 BTU window unit. I used several door seals again to make sure that that is perfectly sealed. There's also some here on the front. They're really hard to see. But when driving down the road, uh, no water or rain can get up inside the ingress inside the camper. Okay, so like I figured, um, definitely getting a lot of questions about my heating and cooling system for this little camper. Now, let me go over some part numbers here. So, that's the control box we're using. That's the touch sensitive uh, thermostat controller we're using. Paperwork for it. And this is the heater that I'm using. Now, let me talk about a few things. So, to be able to make this work, this kit comes with the control box and the touch sensitive panel only. Now the plug that's in it, that's in the end, is the style here. Now I'll see, well actually later I'll probably make a more in depth with all the part numbers because I have to go on eBay to figure out where I ordered this from. But this comes with both parts which are the pins that you can wire yourself, which is this guy here on the end. Um, it comes with a wiring diagram. Now the automotive relay is uh, something that I'm going to use in my fuse block but just any kind of relay would work, uh, basically. And this is the heater that I'm using inside the wall. Now let me spin around here. Sorry about the shakiness. As you see, these two things match up here. Now I actually did get some um, furnace felt uh, graphite uh, for uh, anti-fire purposes. Oh, I actually have it here behind me, let me grab it. So we're gonna use a couple pieces of this, three millimeter thick to be able to protect my wall so it doesn't get hot. So, again, here's the trick. Uh, the AC unit is a two-speed fan, uh, one set of wires for the compressor. So basically it's a five-wire setup, which will match the exact same thing as our control box. So all we had to do was just pin it out to be able to control the high and low on the AC unit, which is down in there, and then the actual uh, neutral and hot wire for the compressor now as you can see that here now to be able to make the furnace or well, it's not really a furnace it's just a wall heater uh, work as you can see there's two wires that come out for the furnace you see furnace Y4 and then Y3 at the bottom that are blue well that's just these uh, two connectors right here so all we have to do is on our relay is you know it only takes two wires to make the relay work and then you need the input and output of the relay uh, to be able to run the uh, whatever item you want to run so what I was going to do is just run a positive directly to the fuse block that makes it hot at all times and use a ground wire that cycles the relay so all there is is just another relay on the inside uh, but I don't want it to, to work the load it's just made for working a lightweight load because they're lightweight uh, let's see if I can see them there you go see those two little relays right there they're really lightweight. So what we do is we just run a ground wire in one side. It completes the circuit, runs the, the ground wire back out, which completes the uh, circuit here. And then all I'm going to do is just run, let's see, get this over here. We're just gonna have one wire hooked up at all times and then one wire go through the relay. So that will con this relay will control, which I'm gonna use a more heavier duty one than this one. Uh, probably wired by itself so people I can put a warning on it to know that there's actual 110 power going to that but uh, that will make this guy cycle on and off now I did talk about making this a high and low as you see there's two elements in there so if I want to split those elements if I want it on high would be 8 amps and if I want it on low which actually only causes one element to work uh, would be 4 amps since we're only using a 15 amp you know power cord or shore power um, whenever my battery charges or anything else may be using more power, I may want to cycle this to a lower power setting. So we can split that off. That can be easily mounted to the wall. And uh, the only thing you have to worry about is how close this is to the wood. So that's what our, our felt protective material is for. So all it takes to hook up the thermostat is just three wires right here on the top. And it communicates through basically a CAN bus or something similar to that to the thermostat. 
And that's how all that works. I will definitely do a demonstration when I get it close to having it all set up. And then this guy gets mounted to the wall way over there. That way I don't have to worry about the AC um, making it cycle on and off. And it's just kind of as simple as that, guys. Uh, we also have our anti-freeze sensor. So obviously this control unit does have to be mounted close to the AC unit. So it's getting tucked up in there. This is going to have a removable panel. Uh, so when you remove it, this is pretty much what you'll see. So the panel goes in there and the, the part of the ducting work is just a foam thing that pushes up against there to separate the two. But it's just kind of simple like that, guys. So now I'm sure you guys want to see the inside of the camper and how far I made it on the inside. So let's just climb on in here. Okay, so again, remember that this is a work in progress and that a lot of things may still change. Okay, so uh, as you see, the amp meter is working. Uh, right now I got two wires backwards on my breaker. So I actually was supposed to, I had two white wires, so one needs to move so it doesn't read correctly. It's only reading the power draw from my uh, battery charger that I have. Well, let's start off first with the AC. So as you guys remember, I was trying to use the uh, controller from a Dometic to run the AC unit. So this is how the AC unit turned out. Now I still need to work on this area right here and I need to add some more air inputs. The compressor should come on here in a second. So that is how loud the AC is when it is running. Now the inlets are here and here and the export of air is here so it definitely cycles the air in the camper quite well now again i have to finish all this but i'll show you how i finish the inside of this a little bit here let me turn the ac off here so then we turn around and then turn the ac off turn the ac off there we go Let that turn all the way off before I try to grab all the pieces out of here. Okay, so to be able to access the AC unit, to be able to clean the uh, coils and all that, right now this piece is just sitting here. It will be mounted down. This piece will have a latch on it, but right now it's just sitting here. And what we did was we mounted the box over there and that's the controller and what we did is this wiring would be mounted here but as you guys remember there was a large hole here well now the air just goes into this hole and pressurizes this area and just blows the air up there'll be a small strip of foam here there'll be a backer here and then there'll be a backer installed on the panel itself here that way you actually have something to come from and it slides out this way this is the AC unit all the way down there. Again, it just sucks the air in here, and this is the export. Kind of simple, and you guys see where I ran the wiring out and into the box. Now, over here on the corner, these two wires right here under my finger, that's what runs the furnace. All I did was take the ground wire that went inside to actually power the box. I looped it back into the relay for the furnace and then made an output wire. Well, the moment that you want the furnace to come on, and let me put all this back together, and I'll show you how the furnace works. So when we turn the furnace on, we come to AC, now furnace. Now I haven't installed a diesel heater or anything like that in here yet, I've thought about it, but right now all I have is this little wall unit. Now I've already had this in 20 degree weather and that works out really well. It keeps everything nice and warm in here and that was before I had any more of this wall insulation in here. Now I still haven't finished it, but you guys have noticed it. I'll talk about it here in a little bit. So with that ground wire coming from the furnace, all it does is supply power to a relay here in the back. So let's go to the back. So right here is the primary relay that actually runs the heater over there. All it does is give a ground wire signal to tell the relay to come on. The AC wires are actually crimped and pinned out to the proper pins for the relay. And this is the relay for the TV. Now we have two CAN bus sides here for power in. And then this is everything for the, uh, the battery charger here, which is a lithium ion battery charger. It's only three amps. 
and then uh, the solar also comes through the same fuse. It is bypassed by the uh, safety relay here that is a safety for amp draw and all that. So if happened that you do draw the RV down too far, that it will still be able to charge early in the morning. And there's also a little light here that indicates if the battery ever gets low. Now I've never had that trigger yet because I've never been able to get the batteries low enough for that. You're the next contestant. So now, as you can see, I did not elect to go with their particular uh, trunk setup here on the front end, as you can see. So I had to make my own. So let's talk a little bit about that. So Home Depot is the only place that I know that sells this really, really thin. It's kind of like an underlayment, but it's like a plywood. Uh, you use it on the back part of your cabinetry sometimes. And I like to use this really, really thin stuff. Now, another reason for why I like using the really thin stuff it's because it works really well in these automotive type seals. So once you add a couple layers of fiberglass on one side or the other, let's go to the other end here. They're just the right size for these seals. And you can go to any junkyard, any u pullet junkyard, find the seal that you think you really like and uh, go with it. Now I chose this particular seal because you can see all the little, little flaps right here. This is to stop any rainwater as we're driving that tries to penetrate the front. Now once this is pulled down like it's supposed to be, and tight but as I raise it you can see the trunk here now simply it's built the same way that they built their little uh, uh, bay or their box so it's just stitching glue again and just came in here and glued it and then pulled a fillet came in here with a couple layers of fiberglass it's only one layer right there just one layer of wood but you can still hear that's pretty tough then we came in here on the top we decided to go ahead and cut our curve that way we can get our seal in here and then I used a cabinet style floor and then we have vents for both sides here near a little screen as you can see you can also see some more of that uh, seal you see that little rubber it's kind of hard to point out here's another automotive seal that presses against the side of the AC unit and stops uh, any weather from again protruding up through that way but this shelf here has survived uh, the whole trip and the battery sitting in here for almost six months now. Uh, this is our junction box over here. This is a lot of the wiring that comes up here that runs the uh, AC units and everything. Now this box is just the right size for those batteries as you saw. Uh, I did insulate the lid. It's a fairly, fairly hefty duty uh, lid here. It's got foam in it to stop the sun from warming up those batteries. And as you can see, it does a good job coming down. I mean, I just, it's already against the seal in the back back there. So that was perfect. And I literally just made the, the box to begin with and I cut the lid out of it and then put the inner platform in there as high as I wanted to for to make it meet this and it worked out really well. Now for this next segment, I apologize. I have to use a lot of pictures. I don't really have any video of building the camper. But if you decide that you'd like to go ahead and copy anything you see here, you're more than welcome to pause the and take any screenshots that you want. Now, before you get ready to install the AC unit, you need to pick your AC unit. You need to figure out which one you want to use. Now, here's the model number in the AC unit that I used. It had a uh, vent that allowed the outside air to blow upward. This was able to work with my advantage of mounting the AC unit below the floor. Now these two small little panels that you see here are actually a load-bearing panel. There was several layers of fiberglass. They also connected to the steel metal rods down that you see that actually support the AC unit. Care must be taken to make sure that you get a decent seal on the bottom. As you can see here, I, I actually add a lot of pieces and complications to this. But it slid in quite well with a couple pieces of foam. And this is the ventilation that blows up inside the cam camper. And this is all the infrastructure that was required for the AC unit to be able to hold it, make, make the vents for it, and then make it work. As you can see, it also gave us a lot of opportunity to be able to make a battery bay or storage bay. Now, all you have to do is figure out the base plate of the size that you want your battery and add a couple extra inches. That way you can add some insulation around it. This also gave me the ability to be able to uh, create a uh, protection barrier for the AC unit for the grill. Now, as you can see, the support panels here support all the weight for the tray. Also take note because of the flex of our hitch that everything that you see here fits inside the hitch. So if the hitch should ever flex in the upward position, 
it never comes in contact with the, the walls of the battery tray. One thing that's different about my trailer is I slid the end of the camper off the end of the, uh, off the end of the trailer. That gave me a couple extra inches for the inlet for my air conditioning, as you see here. And since we're playing with pictures, we'll just finish off the rest of the box here. It's just simple. You finish it off. You figure out where you'd like to go ahead and cut your lid out. Go ahead and cut the upper face plate. Now here I actually added a piece of wood for the hinges to be able to screw to that you can't see. So it looked like down inside. Let me go ahead and make the face plate here. Cut gentle turns. You want your seal to be able to make these turns. If you make too sharp of a curve, your seal will fold. And then you just use uh, appropriate adhesive to glue your seals on. So now let's go under go over the underfloor systems, the water tank, the storage, and the visions that I had for it. So as you guys know, I decided to go with the heaviest version of the Harbor Freight trailer that was available. It's actually a uh, folding style for more storage, which means it made it more versatile. All the parts could be welded where I wanted them to. So it was basically a pre-cut, pre-fab, uh, just put things where I wanted. Now again, because the suspension has almost four to five inches worth of travel, we actually had to add a spacer between our floor and our trailer. Now this is the wood frame that became of that structure. Now, as you can see, you can easily uh, just rip a couple of sheets of plywood for walls and glue and screw them to the sides of all that lumber that you see on top to be able to create a structure. Now, this one here, you need to already know what size water tank that you want to use and how much spacing that you need inside that area. Now, once you already know that, you can go ahead and create that space and it would be nice to go ahead and have the tank on hand. Also, remember to keep enough room at the end of the tank for a lot of your plumbing and in and outlets. Also, an advantage of this is you can also see I have the tank at the center of gravity of the trailer, so it doesn't add any extra hitch weight when it's full or empty. Now, my original goal was to try to get the water pump next to the tank inside, but eventually I found out I was just slightly a little bit too large, so I actually had to place it on the outside of the camper with an access bay to get to it. Also, with the Harbor Freight trailer, there is enough room to create a false wall between the trailer and the tire itself. Uh, to be able to route, route a lot of your uh, inlet water lines and such. Now right here where I built the main support for the jack stand, you can see this is where the inlet water goes in. It is slightly higher than the top of the tank, so you can actually fill the uh, tank all the way up. So now what do we have all that water for? Well, we definitely have a kitchen sink, and there's actually plenty of room for a sink. We also have a little miniature washing machine, and we also have a shower tent. So we actually... Ah, dog! So anyhow, our kitchen sink is just actually just a, a plain Jane salad bowl. It's a 13 quart salad bowl. I was actually able to find a uh, faucet where I used a, the single side faucet where you only have one side. And I also got the standard little drain that you can get anywhere from eBay. Uh, there's the kitchen sink. As you see, I'll back up a good ways. There's actually still plenty of room. Your feet don't get anywhere near the sink. I have it up in there as far as I can to the back with the drain. Your drain goes through the wall. Now it's time to talk about storage. Now you can see I have this large area or space in the front. It's almost a four by four area and it gives me plenty of storage. Now you have to uh, weld the brackets on the left and right for the hitch to be able to uh, mount to, but as you can see, there's quite a bit of storage. Now from the underside here, I actually drilled some tiny holes to figure out where I wanted the doors at. And I just connected with a straight line, uh, all four lines, to figure out where the door was. It's a lot easier to do it this way. Now on the inside of the trailer, as you see the, the four drill holes, you'll connect the lines up top. I forgot to add that. And that will get you completely flush in those corners. Now you're going to do the same thing kind of like how I did in the water tank. And you're going to add uh, pieces of plywood to the sides. Now what you're doing is, one, you're creating the infrastructure to be able to hold the floor for the storage compartment. But you're also la layering up the sides, which will actually create two of the four sides to be able to support the, the little panel of the door that you cut out. Now we need to get ready for insulation and the support for the floor. So now you need to figure out what thickness insulation you're going to use. I use three quarter, and so you need to cut three quarter by three quarter inch little pieces of wood to be able to screw to. Now after you install your insulation, you go ahead and put your paneling on it. Now the reason why we're doing this all in reverse too is because there's only eight inches of space. That's what I had to work with. So you're going to have to do this all backwards like this to be able to create it. 
Now when you get the kit, you actually get several strips of marine grade plywood, three quarter inch, or maybe even one inch, or five eighths. And they're used to raise the trailer up, depending on what kind of trailer that you choose. Now I use them to cut them up to match the material that's in the floor. So you have to create two backers, and that's what we're using right here. This is also what gives our floor uh, strength and integrity to keep it from warping or moving or anything like that. So they add a lot of strength. Now, when you're done with it, you should get something that looks like this, where you have four areas of underlap. That way the door can just settle and sit right inside its little uh, cubby hole. Now, something else that you see is these two two by fours right here. Now, they're just cut the exact length to reach down and meet the floor. And what they are is they're supports to be able to, uh, they'll grab two runners or two stringers that are actually in the floor of the storage compartment to help support the weight of the, the storage compartment. That way, if you put anything heavy in there. Now, to make life easier on you, it is a lot easier to go ahead and use basically a marine grade paint is what I used and get in here and paint all of this. It's so much easier. It's also really easy to hold up the, the final floor or piece of plywood, which is about half inch thick, and mark out everywhere where you do not want paint at. Uh, you can see on this piece of panel here. And once you get everything painted, you'll wind up with something like this where you can actually have surface to be able to glue with. Uh, the paint doesn't quite go all the way to the edges, but it sure makes it a lot easier to to have all that painted because it's going to need several coats to be able to uh, properly seal it. So now we're ready to install the insulated floor. But first we have to start with the main panel that holds all the weight. Now you remember these little th uh, three quarter by three quarter inch pieces we put in here? Well you'll literally be able to screw to them right here and this will allow you to screw upward. Make sure you use plenty of glue or maybe even the fillet. I used the fillet right here to uh, be able to uh, mount to the bottom of that. Then you need to go ahead and run your runners that right here. Now this was the leftover material I talked about four, and they'll just get mounted on the ends and then catch that two by four in the middle. There'll be two of them, so they're out of screen on this particular shot. Okay, so here you'll have three leftover spaces that uh, require insulation. Now you'll be able to just cut them long ways right here and be able to insert them tightly. Now, since you use three quarter inch on the outer uh, perimeter, you'll actually be able to staple and glue to that. So what you'll do is you'll come up with a small piece of blue on or marine grade plywood that's really thin and be able to just tack it right here uh, all the way around your perimeter. And after that, you just need some marine grade paint on the bottom and you're done. Now that your panels are cut loose, you need to go ahead and protect them. So I definitely wanted to go ahead and get some kind of resin soaked into the edges and the corners. So I went ahead and, and put one coat on that to be able to protect them. What doggy? Doggy! So I found a recess uh, hinge tool that you can get from Home Depot for like $9. Worked very well for making the size holes for the finger holes to be able to move the pieces of panel and all that. So that worked out really great. And then I routed out the uh, uh, edges of the hole to make them round and nice on the fingers. Now here's one added idea that you can do. Now you can see where the table saw insert went from my water tank. Well, if you decide to only do half the size of the water tank, you could actually make the other size a battery bay. And you can go ahead and make another door and another accessible panel on the other side about the same size for uh, being able to get your battery in storage and stuff down below above your axle. Let's go. So now that brings us back around to the rear storage. Now, sadly, you actually will lose a lot of the Harbor Freight trailer. You see that piece of steel sticking off the end there and where the wood stops? You literally will remove that much of the trailer steel. And that's why I had to move the axle forward. Now, the original idea consisted of a battery bay in the middle with two drawers down each side. And I originally was going to use uh, lightweight drawer glides uh, down the sides, as you see right here. Now, here's where the idea got a little bit crazy for Lowell. So you see right here on the right side. Now this is where I decided to, or where I was trying to decide to put the refrigerator. So I ordered a small 15 cubic inch refrigerator. That was about $160. And it fit right here on the right side. Now here's a slightly more crazy idea. On the left side, I found a washing machine that was the exact height of the refrigerator. Now in my area, I can find these little washing machines for about $250, $300 at a time. Now you see there's plenty of room back there, but the original idea, or the original thing that actually killed the whole idea, was these fold-up jacks. 
Now, I just wasn't able to actually create the drill the way I wanted to and uh, be able to get everything to fit properly because I installed those jacks. Now, I probably could have lowered them a little bit more, but I was coming very short on time and everything. So I decided I, I just wanted to go ahead and keep the full size drawer that I had. And I really like these little latches that uh, allow me to have all my mechanisms on the inside. That way they can't be uh, fiddled with on the outside. Now one more thing I'd like to add before I move on away from the drawer. Now you see that the tag is mounted on the drawer and it's capable of moving in and out. How do we light that tag? How do we actually get a uh, clearance light on that tag? So I'm not sure if you noticed it before, but if you've noticed this little hole right here, it's not only a hole for helping pull the drawer open, but it's actually the hole that helps the tag light. Now if you notice when I was underside, under the camper trying to show uh, how the power gets into the drawer, you'll also notice that there's actually a, a light permanently mounted to the underside of the camper right here. And this is what shines through the hole and actually lights up our tag very efficiently actually. Now in later upgrades, I plan on adding a one-way diode to that light. That way, whenever I turn on the hood light for the cooking stove and all that, the tag light comes on. Now the reason why I'd like that light to come on is because it actually helps light the inside of the drawer late at night when I'm trying to search for things. Because the drawer is so far underneath the edge of the camper, it actually has a hard time uh, seeing down in there with the uh, light on the hood like that. So let's go over my trunk latches because I know some people may want to copy this idea. Now I think I got this out of a 2004, maybe three and newer vehicle. There's the actual part number. And so what you can do is I just used a simple piece of paper and I took a pair of scissors and cut the notch out and then just squeezed it with my thumbs. And you get almost a perfect template. And as you see, because one is offset, you need to offset this too. Now I installed this first before I ever thought about mounting the piece on the trunk because that was easier to figure out where it needed to go last. So what I did was I got that. Now these little guys here all I do is they spin a motor. It's like a windshield wiper or I meant a, a window wiper motor and it spins this little gearbox right here which moves this little guy right here. Now let me go ahead and set this off with a screw. Let's see. So as the, the, the latch the trunk wants to latch, it goes like this. Now our little emergency pull handle pulls this down right here, and this will cause the latch to open. Right. So let me reset again. Now if you're wanting to do it electronically, it's very hard to do on your hand, my hands. What we're using is we're using a momentary switch. So over here, uh, sorry, over here. We just use a simple, simple momentary switch that's just spring-loaded that returns. Now what that does is that just pulses as you press the power to the uh, unit. Now you also don't have to worry too much because this guy right here is a fuse. It's a built-in fuse. Now if I come over here and I connect the two wires, it's probably going to be really hard to do one-handed. You'll see that latch open up. Now another thing you can do while I'm doing this is you can install a uh, fast blowing auto reset automotive fuse and uh, so if you're worried about uh, too much voltage on the line or anything like that as you uh, press the button because it does freeze the motor whenever it's trying to spin it doesn't freely spin so as you see you'll see an arc it'll take a little bit of voltage but uh, now watch that latch you'll see it open okay see how that opened so that's just simply how it works. You're just momentary feeding positive on this wire, negative on this wire, and it opens right up. Now I do believe that this is just a throughput on the ground. So if you actually want, let's see where it's at. See this little sensor right here? Sorry. If you want this little sensor to work, you can actually run this ground wire to a something like this. Now this is my battery cutoff. Can't tell if you can actually see the battery symbol in there. Yeah, there you go. You can kind of see it. But you can actually get an open trunk light, and whenever the trunk is open, you can actually have a light that comes on to let you know that you haven't closed the trunk all the way. And that's not something I'm going to do. I definitely want a battery disconnect for low voltage. But that's pretty much the gist and the idea behind uh, this guy right here. Now, the moment you get this installed here, you don't know which direction it will go here and there. So the moment it is installed, what I did is I just laid down inside the trunk and I used an angle finder and I was able to layer up two pieces of wood right here. I found the angle that made it flat and I actually put this in the latch the way it was supposed to be. 
and I literally, you know, marked everything out and got it perfect. Uh, there is two body backing nuts in here. They're like body bolt, body panel like bolts or whatever. These are the standard 10 millimeters that you get. And so I can easily unbolt this and change it out or move it, but that'll allow you to, to adjust that way. And if you need to, to pull the trunk down more, just add spacers underneath here, like a little piece of wood. Uh, you can add several layers like wood right here and that will draw down and that's how you can do the adjustment like that i would definitely look for these guys that have the you know get out of the trunk latches so again if there's ever a power failure or something went wrong or this unit ever fails you can still your vacation's not ruined because you can get in here and just easily pop the trunk open so gracie's going to demonstrate how to open the rear trunk if there's ever a power outage So this is what our control panel was kind of matured to. Now this commentator, or this pulse width modulation is to turn this guy up and down. So at night, it's not lighting up the whole inside of the RV while we're trying to sleep. Now the, you guys know this button right here, when I press it, my trunk automatically opens. So that's my trunk latch. Now, one of the other issues that I had with this camper, uh, part of the review here, is how this rear trunk is sealed. Now, one of the things that they tell you in the manual, which I've talked about before, is they just want this to be a drain, and that this seal actually never seals on the sides of this canopy. Now, uh, it, isn't, it wouldn't be very hard, and it wouldn't add any weight at all to cut one piece that's got the curve to it right here and then one flat piece to go on it exactly like I did. And then you can actually fill it in the corners here and right here like I did, which again, this isn't finished. I know this area is finished right here. And I have a few 3D printed parts going here and here to hide some of this stuff, but it wouldn't be hard at all. And I also believe that uh, you really need to add a piece of wood here like I did. Uh, because as I went to close the roof with the, the force on it, both sides of this canopy started to twist on me. So as you can see, I added that piece in there and I actually added it as a curve too. So I didn't clamp it perfectly straight. I actually curved the, the lid. So when I pressed down, it actually did apply some pressure here on the sides. But I don't think it was a very good idea to create a lid that will not seal on the sides and uh, I took a trip again uh, to Yellowstone with this thing and I did uh, 45 miles on a back road with rocks and that's before I ever made it to Yellowstone and then as I got into Yellowstone some of the dusty roads this whole area was just covered in dust I'm still getting dust out of here and corners where it you know added up in the corners and stuff so definitely if you decide to get this kit before you install any of this galley stuff, as you got the rear door closed, come in here and it's a lot easier to just go ahead and fabricate something that will make this door seal fit correctly. You want to be able to get your trunk to open and close, fully closed. Now, uh, I literally will, I just had somebody come up and press on the trunk, but you have to climb inside this thing. Now, a little trick that I did was I had the seal installed, and I had all this done. Uh, but I came in here with almost a toothpick style of balsa wood. And so I took little pieces of balsa wood and I literally CA glued them really quickly in here. And they actually post, they passed the inside of the door jam here, but at a little bit of an angle. As you can see, they're all at an angle in there. And I know it's not the prettiest thing in there, but again, I'm not finished. That'll actually get filled. So we got them in there and then slightly... Uh, I went in there with a pin and marked them and I used my vibrating tool and I cut them off. And what I did was I used a small strip of wood cut to the width all the way down through here and then glued that on there really quickly. So then I knew once I added my foam, as you see, it's perfect. Now to be able to strengthen that up, I came on the inside with another piece of wood, as you can see. So I just, and fiberglass that in place. Now, all this is going to get another layer of insulation in here, so you're not going to see most of this anyways when I'm done. 
Uh, again, I have to get my gas struts in here. Now the balsa wood is a cute trick because you're actually able to take it. Now this is all unfinished here, but bend it with super glue where you want it to because you can literally come in here with a short pen and mark where everything is at. And then here I just cut a piece of wood at the right, sorry, at the right angle, glued that in place, also fiberglass that in place, and then used the balsa wood bent and I used the wood fillet to fill in some areas give myself a platform and it worked out really nicely all the way around now we know that this here was where it's supposed to be and all this meets like it's supposed to be so the only places you have to worry about making this meet correctly is where these corners turn and going up through here so as you can see when my trunk is closed when it's pressing up against that that is a huge gap so if rain comes in here sideways or anything weird like that, it doesn't really get in this channel and come out very well. So an illustration on my trunk meets again. Sorry, I'm doing this so, so many handed weird. So that's how that meets. That side meets perfectly and there meets perfectly. I guess I'm a bad cameraman. <laughs> Come to this side. As you can see, the way the foam's in, indented. And yes, my kitchen sink doesn't hit. And it's just a little bit of pressure and it latches. That works out really well. I'm very proud of how that turned out. I'm still working on the insulation on the trunk hood, but as you can see, that's coming along nicely. Now you can also see I don't have any screws going through the trunk lid for the actual gas struts. I was actually able to build all that inside the trunk lid. So as everybody knows, I really like this mica. Uh, you can buy this pretty cheaply off of eBay. Sometimes you can get full rows of this stuff sent to your house for $30 with free shipping. And sometimes they can be 12 foot by 5 foot wide, so they can be really big. Some of them will be damaged, but they'll have some cracks and breaks on the end. But I usually go on eBay and I order a big stash of these. What I'm going to do is I'll use several different colors that I have. And like you see the back plate right there. When I get ready to do this particular wall, because I have to insulate this wall, I have to insulate back there. I still have to finish insulating the inside of my trunk here. But I'll use several different tones and colors of this Formica to be able to help break up the monotony of all the, you know, the exact same color. And yeah, I've actually been working on my clear coat lately and still sanding and working on that. Uh, it's coming really slow. I'm sorry that it took so long for me to get this video out, guys, and I do apologize for that. But there's been so much going on. Uh, because I've been adding weight to my roof, I also, as you can see, a little piece of wood, I have to order two new heavier... Uh, struts I was okay with that and knew that going into it So what I do is the the trunk can open halfway but to hold it the rest of the way up I have to put this little piece of wood in here for right now So what I'll do is I'll just go to a discount or something like that and I'll grab a couple of these exact length ones But I'll go up in increments because they usually go up by five pounds per piece and uh, I'll go ahead and probably just get two of them that have uh, that are stronger by five pounds What more storage again? Oh my god Anyways, when you uh, install the trailer, or the camper body under the trailer, you get a lot of perimeter around the corner, uh, which we call trailer, trailer trim or skirting or things like that. So I'm going to start off with the driver's side front corner and how I created that. So we're going to start with a cutaway here in the illustration. Now this is looking at the front of the trailer head on. Now you need to use your angle finder and you'll transfer that angle to the table saw. You'll go ahead and cut you off a little piece like this and you'll transfer that over to the floor. Now remember to keep enough spacing off the edge for the thickness of your outer uh, plywood. Now you're gonna go ahead and install it and then you're gonna go ahead and the table saw is a good job for being able to rip the sheets of foam that you need. So you go ahead and press that foam in there nice and tightly. It will stay in there, it won't fall out if you get it nice and tight. Now you'll add some fillet and your uh, bottom piece of material. It's a good time to make sure you also don't overlap that little piece. Now here's where things get a little bit complicated because you have to build a mold for a uh, that last little piece of fiberglass there. Now you don't have to, but that's what I created in that particular area because that's where a lot of my wet items go. So let's say that you're breaking down a campsite 
and it's raining and you don't uh, your extension cord is soaked and anything else that you might be trying to work with. So I literally created this fiberglass piece and I'm going to try to explain how to make that as well. So what I forgot to mention before is when you cut this little piece right here to be able to screw to the floor, it actually is fairly long, but you actually want a couple of them. Uh, you want to be able to have a couple for the other side. Now you see from the, they're the length of this fiberglass piece. So just slightly up front of the tire there all the way at the end, you can actually see it right here. Now what's the, what makes this part so much more difficult is the fact that uh, I did have a video on how to create this part, but it was lost uh, with a hard drive crash. So right here, you can see the little piece of wood in the background. It's already got the angle. And so you screw that down to your workbench. Then you take this little piece of uh, paneling that you see right here and you just kind of staple it right there. You're just making a temporary mold is what you're doing. Now see the aluminum tape that I have here? It works very well for a non-stick surface. The fiberglass will not stick to that aluminum tape. Now sometimes it will pull the lettering off, which you can actually see in some of these pictures. The lettering was transferred, but that's okay. You're just sanding it off and painting over it. Now whatever impression or uh, like a door or uh, mold or anything that you want to put in your your fiberglass you literally just like for me I just cut out a plug out of plywood and I literally screwed it down right on top of the fiberglass right here and then I covered it in fiberglass and then I was able to overlap my uh, fiberglass over the top of it and use my fillet and that's what gave me my lip for my rubber seal to be able to uh, uh, be able to clamp to again keep in mind that you can't do very sharp corners because the the seal has a uh, metal strips in it so it can only bend and warp so far and then you lay down all of your fiberglass and then you literally pop your mold off and then you wind up with a part like this and uh i went ahead and installed it as you see here i actually used rivets from the bottom and fill it to be able to rivet uh to the metal frame and then since you uh had a uh, uh you recessed the piece of wood back a little bit on the floor with the foam it uh, now is flush with the outside of the camper and it's all the proper angle and shape. Now there's one more thing that you need to think of and why you still have access to this, you need to think about wiring. Now I'm sure in many of the pictures you keep seeing this half inch water conduit or water pipe. Uh, it literally is PEX tubing pipe at half inch, red and blue. You see it uh, strewn around all in the lower half of the RV. Well, I'm actually using that for conduit for electrical wiring. Now, a large uh, heavy-duty extension cord will actually fit inside where the plug's cut off, of course, uh, this uh, half-inch PEX tubing. Now, what you can do is, as you're building up the bottom of the camper, you run several pieces of, the, pieces of this everywhere, and it allows you to, uh, again, come back with your wiring later, and it protects all your wiring as well. Now these front corner pieces are complicated, but they're not. Uh, start with the center piece here and just butt it up against the floor. Trace the right hand side and then trim it out. And then you'll be able to uh, take another piece that's here on the left. You'll actually be able to hold it up uh, how far you want it to uh, come underneath the camper, your angle of the dangle. Trace that and then you'll literally be able to copy those two pieces for the other side. And uh, it's just simply tracing what you have right there and your angles. So now as you can see, this angle is not the same angle that's in the back here. So since our table saw and all of our uh, tools are still set for this particular angle, we're gonna go to the other side now. We're gonna go ahead and create its storage area uh, next. So we'll go back to our illustration here and we're just gonna mirror it the other direction because we're pretty much copying the first few steps that I did. You're going to wind up uh, wanting to get the foam and all the insulation up on the top as well but it's going to look a little bit different. It's going to look like this from the uh, the cutaway view again. Now this is something I forgot to mention on the other side, but right here you can see that we terminate both the little storage compartments with a little bulkhead. Now you will have to install these uh, first uh, to, to figure out what or how long that you want your, your bay to be or your little storage compartment. So on the outside of the camper here, we're going to go ahead and use a straight edge we can use the straight edge to be able to tell us where our seal should be. You also have to know what seal that you chose. And it'll also let us know where we have to install our bulkhead here as well. Now, by also using the straight edge, we're going to use that to draw a line, offset how far that we actually want it to be uh, where our, our thickness of our seal is. Now, this line is going to be for a little piece of square plywood here that we cut out to uh, be able to glue to the side. Now, this looks like this piece right here that's actually got the curve in it so far. Now you're just gonna tack those in with CA glue. 
Now you need to cut two thin little strips here. You need a lower one and you need an upper one. Now, once you have all four of them, you know, uh, CA glued in there, you're going to have a square looking hole that looks like this up here on the left. Now you'll be able to use your straight edge or something that you can bump against it to make sure all your angles match are correct. Now at this point to get everything flush, you need to create another little thin strip right here. Now keep in mind, this little thin strip actually pokes down just a little bit. And what this does is it helps keep uh, water from draining back towards the seal. It makes a drip on the little edge of the door and helps with waterproofing the door. Now once you've done all your fillet and add a few layers of fiberglass, again, I like three ounce, you can go ahead and cut out these uh, round curves in your material. That way it can uh, conform to the seal. Uh, now one of the things I forgot to mention was this little lower floor right here for the little storage compartment. I already put a couple layers of fiberglass on the top of it that goes against the bottom of the floor. And I just put a couple of rivets in there to hold it in place. So it was already glued in place, but it was a little flimsy out towards the end. Now installing that little outer trim edge allowed that to be a lot stronger. That's also what your hinges are going to go to. Now it's kind of hard to see, but when choosing my door seals, I actually got a door seal that had a little bit of a little piece of rubber that pokes up. And uh, what it does is it help keeps the water from uh, draining down on the uh, face of the seal. This helps with waterproofing. It's kind of hard to see here, but it's here. Now these seals are actually goes against the back glass of, uh, I believe it was a Ford Explorer. It may have been some kind of a Zuzu or something like that. What you do is you go to Upalit Junkyards and you just look around and these seals are really thin. These are the thinnest seals I've been able to find and they're not, a made, they're not made to put a lot of pressure against the glass. So they work very well for this application. Now the doors are really easy to create, but they have to be the last thing that you create because you want them to be flush like this, but they're not going to be. They're gonna poke out about this far. Now, the moment you realize how far they poke out, you just set your, your table router or your little router, the, the depthness of that. Now you see how deep it is right there? You just set it for that depth. After you route that out and you add a few layers of fiberglass, you now have a perfect door that will go to the exact, uh, be flush of the door. Now you can see where I installed my door hinges here and all that. And you see, I left a little bit extra material. Now what I did is I, rivet, I used rivets from the bottom to actually hold the door on and then I used aircraft uh, lock nuts, high locks I believe they were, to uh, be able to bolt them to the bottom. Now, this is the distance you see from the bottom so you see it is nice and sealed. Now you have to choose what door latches you want. Now I used a retracting door latch. These worked out really well. Uh, they come in very different uh, shapes and sizes. I'll show you some from my RV. Now here's a cam lock style and here's a non-lockable style. You just have to figure out if you want your doors to be able to lock or not. What these latches do is they turn out of the way, but when you need them to suck in, you just turn them. See how these work right here? Now this will allow you that you, you know, you want to be able to pull against the door seal to make everything flush. So they're highly adjustable and they're a lot more easier to use. And you can find these on eBay for like $10 a piece or $10 a set. Now I did have to glue a little piece of wood up in there for those latches to be able to grab a hold of and be able to pull the door closed. So you do have to give it some kind of backer. Now these particular doors are so small, they didn't require a lot of pull-in, so I, they, these latches worked perfectly. Same principle on the other side, but as you can see, these door hinges are slightly different. So what you do is you use rivets over here, at least that's what I did. You go ahead and drill the exact size hole, but you use your fillet material, your epoxy fillet material. And you insert your rivets and you lightly pull on the rivets to get everything tightened up and wait for your epoxy to harden. You can see them on the back side. After your epoxies are hardened, you can go ahead and one, cut off the rivets after tightening just a little bit more or make them pop. I was able to make the uh, rivets on the lower side actually pop, but the ones on the top, uh, I had plenty of pressure, but I still cut them off. So I have to admit that these bays worked out really wonderfully and beautifully. They all have the exact same key. So the door locks key works for the side compartments. Um, this bay worked out perfectly. I have a collapsible water hose up there. I was like, you know, to take care of one. They actually work out really great. The extension cord, the extension cord slides backwards just right there. And as you see, the lock fits there really nicely. So that's everything that I would need from this side of the trailer to be able to fill the water tank, plug myself in and be able to lock the tire. This bay also worked out beautifully. Uh, no water intrusion whatsoever. Uh, the little temperature sensor, uh, right now I've been just stuffing out here, but I have enough wire to be able to run it. I was going to run it underneath the trailer somewhere and place it somewhere uh, where it can show me outdoor temperatures. 
Uh, my meter is capable of being able to read from many temperatures, so I'm going to have one in the battery bay, one internal, and one external like this. Now let's talk about where the fenders go in that middle area right there. Now what I did was I actually temporarily screwed uh, the fenders up to against the floor, flush against the floor. Now you're not going to get any insulation in this area because uh, any insulation in that area would actually have raised the uh, floor of the trailer up more. So what you do is you go ahead and you get your fenders up in there in that little area. Now you already have your previous bulkhead slightly to the right there. Now you go ahead and add another one to your left and it's just simply cutting in the little panels and sliding them on top of the fender. The fender will hold everything up where it belongs. Now you want to go ahead and stuff those with foam because you absolutely want to insulate that as best you can. And you also want to go ahead and install the rear wall for the tail light. Now all these little walls are the same shape and size. And at this point, it's just filling out everything. Now you see where I've added the structure also for the jack to help support the jacks. And again, the PEX tubing is also ran at this time to help with your uh, like wiring. Now it's just as simple as finish on, finishing off the rest of your paneling on the outside to get everything all flush and smooth. Now you can see where the wire tubing comes out the back for the wiring for the tail light. Now the other side is mostly the same, but there was a little bit more infrastructure. Now the top hose is actually the water line. The other two red lines go up to the AC unit. Now you can see where I made a kind of a terminal block type area right here. You can see where the lines actually end, where they're cut off right there. Those go with corresponding lines that actually go inside the wall. Uh, since I was adding um, almost one inch worth of insulation around my feet, I was actually able to use these tubing going up the wall. And that's what actually transmits a lot of the power and infrastructure into the galley. Now here's that little junction box taking uh, shape. Now you can see the open space underneath the water pump. That has an access hatch. That's a clear piece of plexiglass where I can see in there, see if anything leaks. But as you can see, that's where my water inlet goes in and uh, where my actual power goes in as well. So as a benefit uh, for using the Harbor Freight Trailer and on for adding these jack stand posts that come off the side of the trailer, I was easily able to also take this lock and I can wrap my extension cord through this lock a couple of times. It keeps people from just easily walking away with my extension cord. And the other thing too is you can take a security cable and this is a six foot security cable and a grade 10 lock. And you can actually run it through these holes and around the axle a few dozen times. And it helps keep people from just being able to drive off of their trailer really easily. We all know how uh, uh, valuable these things are and how easy it is for somebody to just run away with one. So that was one of my security options that I decided to choose to go with it. Is it going? Take one. Okay, so today I'm going to work on trying to show you guys how to do a stock fuse block. Now, if you like a fuse block that kind of looks like mine here, where everything is kind of really nice and neat, I'm going to teach you guys how to do that. Now, this requires you guys to get your hands a little down and dirty. Now, you can buy these particular components brand new, but I think this little guy is like 30 bucks or something like that. So, your favorite thing, and I've always said this in my past videos, is you're going to want to go to a U Pullet junkyard. Because, I mean, this has an accessory on here and all this kind of stuff. And this particular car had both of these fuse blocks. Now, different fuse blocks comes in all different shapes and sizes, as you can see here in the video. Now, this particular fuse block I got from a Chevrolet product. And all the, th all the items I'm going to talk about here is Chevrolet. Because Ford and Dodge, their connectors are a little harder to get a hold of or work with. Now, you're going to have to create some tools because since you're trying to get some of these parts used, and you will be ordering some new parts, obviously. Uh, so the first thing you want to do is these little bundles of wire on eBay are really cheap. I think $15 comes with 10 foot of each color, and this is an automotive grade wire. I believe this is 16 gauge, uh, and you can get a small assortment of different color of wires. Now you're going to have to go on Mauser or some other website and you're going to have to order your pins. But first let's, let's show you how to take some of this stuff apart. Now for the particular fuse block right here, for these large fuses right here, it's this particular type of fuse line. This pin is pretty hard to press down to get these guys out. This is going to be the hardest connection that you're going to have to take apart. But these are actually right up in here and this is where this fuse goes. Now, since you have a primary circuit come in like I do, what you're going to do is you're going to want to take one of these guys, and when you cut the wiring out of the fuse block, or you cut the fuse block out of the car, try to get these pieces kind of as long as you can. And what you're going to do is you're going to loop back in, and you're going to come over here and you're going to catch a fuse. Uh, it's actually up here. 
Now, how they do, you see where they have these bridge lines right here? What you do is, uh, I'll talk about the tool to take this apart. What we do is you actually only crimp one of these particular lines and this whole segment goes in here. So this gives power to a whole line of these fuses right here. This is why I have two separate fuses. Now, the, just the power line comes from one end of the fuse and comes up and grabs one line. The other end of the fuse comes up and grabs the other. Now, what you're going to do is from your whatever your accessory is, your item, you'll go ahead and crimp your own wire onto it, and it goes just right next to the fuse and clips into place. Now, these won't clip because I haven't, uh, because the tabs are pressed down. So, how do you recycle these parts here, or how do you reuse them? So for this particular style right here, you take a hose clamp and you grind it down. You see the little bit of a bend that I have right here? Okay, so what you do is that slides in right next to the, uh, there's a little tab hole right here. Let me put this back in here so you can see it. So there's a little tab hole right here and what you're doing is you're pressing this down inside this little tab hole and that reaches up in here and it will press this tab down now this little tab here just bends up and down sorry for my ugly finger now this tab here just bends out and that's what actually clips the pin in here now you can see that this is a segment of this guy right here so again what they're doing is they're just coming back in here and they're running a jumper segment all the way across here so this is how you get power to your fuses so on uh, line they're considered a dial fly automotive 150 series connector so both these connectors are exactly the same thing just one allows the ability to carry power across multiple ports and then you have your single little end port so you bring your device in whatever your device may be if it's lights your ceiling fan water pump whatever and you go ahead and you crimp these guys on here and you just go ahead and stuff that in right next to the next fuse that's how i did my wiring accessories now here's the type of plugs that you can get now there's two different types for delphi you have the little miniature mini connectors and then you have the slightly larger now this is the size i use all the time as you can see they come in one i don't have a two connector but three four six and eights and even larger than that and this is what the little pin looks for that. So as you can see here also, there's a little tab right here that if you press down, that's how you get that particular tab out. And then we have the same thing right here. See that little tab right there? So when you want to recycle these guys, it's the same thing. But what I normally do is right there where it comes up See that little notch where that comes up? I just take a little needle and I stab it in there. Now when you pull that out, what you're going to get is you're going to get a piece of wire, but you're also going to get these little rubber inserts. Now this is something you also have to salvage from some of the plugs. So these little rubber inserts slide right onto the wire here, like so. And so when you're recycling these, just cut these off and pull the little rubber thing off and save them. But that's pretty much how that goes and clamps together. Now what do we use for our tool for clamping? Well, you're going to have to spend, sometimes you can find these guys used or even new for $30, but their average price is about 50 bucks. You see they have the crimp style for the uh, crimping the wiring for two different uh, gauge wires and two different size for the little rubber guys right here. So that's simply all you have to do here. Now our relays are the same thing. They look exactly like this particular pen but they have the little space missing, as you can see there. If you ever decide that you want to use one of these large relays, which you can use a 5-pin or 4-pin, the connectors are still the same, you can do the same thing. Now, it's ever been rare that I've ever used these really large connectors. Uh, if you have an inverter that big, you're not going to uh, be trying to connect it with this, and all the accessories in an RV are small enough that don't quote me on it but if i remember correctly these will actually hold up these little pins will hold up to 10 to 15 amps so at that point you're fine 
I use commonly a lot of these little four pin connectors. They're really easily because many devices are about four or three pin. This is, I always get these off of uh, O2 sensors from the exhaust. They're always four pin and they need to be able to disconnect. So if you find a whole bunch of cars in the junkyard, you can cut these guys off of. That works really nicely. Now, if you come down here, you'll see my little bin. I'll bring it to you. So this is my little stash of connectors. And this is the only label I can read, so I'm sorry. The larger series male connectors are 280, but these smaller ones are actually uh, 150s. And you can just go online, and after you take a few plugs apart, especially the really large plugs, you're going to get a whole bunch of these little terminal ends and everything to be able to create well, whatever wiring you want. Now let's talk about mounting. So if you pan up here, you can see how I mounted this wire here, and then I put a, a th uh, well, this is actually a three pin because it was made to have another wire. But you see how that's mounted right here? Well, all I did was you can get many of these little guys here. All they do is they just shove right into the back right here. And they're universal, you can put them any way you want. And that allowed me, as you can see, I used one of these here to screw that guy there, that way it's mounted. And then, uh, pardon me here. Oh, and you get plenty of these little tape type uh, connectors here that you can use to uh, tape to your wire. And as you see, that's what we used here. Now, if you decide that you get a hold of a couple of these little connectors, uh, these are the smaller pin guys. Now, I usually use this for like dash clusters, things with really light loads in them. But these are also really easy to take apart. Now, this is one of my favorite tools for being able to take this apart. So this little shroud right here just pops right off. And as you can see, here's the little pins right here that you use to be able to pull these out. So you just go in there with a little needle, needle, poke it in there, and all the wiring just literally falls out. Of course, you have to take the little backer off here. But that works on both of these type of connectors. I mean, you just, when you're wanting to take these apart, now you have access to the back. When you unplug it, you shove a needle in right here in this particular top point. The wires come out the back, and then now you can salvage. These little pins and connectors, I was able to order 50 of each type for, I think, like $3 or something like that. These are the only things that you're going to have to order to be able to make that work. Go ahead and stop for a minute. Now this is our battery monitor that I decided to go with. As you guys remember, there used to be a trimetric in this area. So I just 3D printed a new plate that made everything look the same size. This is just a simple readout really quickly. The refrigerator, the control panel runs. Uh, there's actually five shunts in this RV that tells me just about everything. The main power shunts for the 1000 watt inverter, it tells me what it's drawing, what I'm taking from the control panel, from the fridge, and what I'm actually putting in. So I'm not confused with trying to guess how many amps are coming in and out through just like one trimetric meter. I can actually see everything here. Also, I uh, put the sensor in for my water tank. It actually tells me in gallons exactly uh, when I'm full. Uh, we have the outside temperature unit and the barometer, how many days till full, how many days till empty, and so forth. It's simple meter, it's their cheapest meter that they have. Uh, so that's an introduction of that. The refrigerator only pulls less than 3 amps. It's like 2.4 or something like that. So I have no problems whatsoever running that compressor style refrigerator. Now we talked about the TV. Now if I go this direction, you'll hear the relay click hopefully. And that will power the TV in 110. Now if I want to power the TV in 12 volt, I flip the switch that direction. And hopefully I don't get anything YouTube doesn't like that comes on. And yes, I literally am about to. No, I do not want help. Do not want the kitchen. So there is our TV, and it works completely well off of 12 volt power. It barely uses like two amps as well. As you can see, you know, it's with it off. It's not hardly reading anything. These are our pulse modulation. So this one here, you see the green light. This is actually running all the lights for, so at night when I wanna to go to sleep, these lights are kind of bright, so I can actually set them for any brightness that I want. They are actually lighting blue lights underneath these guys here. Now these are actually also working lights that are in the rear. 
And now we'll talk about that. So you guys can also see that that also is lit up and working there. So now the other knob is also the same thing. It's also a pulse with modulation. Uh, you leave this one all the way on, even though you can't click them and turn them off. Uh, I leave it about 50 to 8 percent. The reason why I do that is because this runs the interior light. Let me make sure I actually turn the light switch on. So this runs this light with a dimmer switch. So I leave it on and I normally just set the brightness and then turn it off. Now this power switch, all it does is it's taking a power input, running it into these two switches, and it runs two separate power outputs. The reason for that is I have two sets of lights on the outside of the trailer and sometimes I only want one or the other, I want both. Uh, the other thing to go over is as I'm putting in this insulation, there's also a large set of shelves that go right here. You can actually put stuff in that goes above the TV. This little guy is only temporary mounted right here, but it goes under the underside of the shelf. So all these switches and knobs and everything will be facing you where you can get to them. I thought about putting another set of like miniature shelves to put in here, but then it would probably muffle the sound from the TV. Uh, the other item that I did, which hasn't been fully installed yet, is I did add a 110 plug because I have a miniature carbon dioxide detector, CO detector, and it's also a charger and all that. And I have also used it for this 12 volt heated blanket, which I didn't really need because as I started adding insulation to the camper, I never really plugged it in. Uh, it pulls about four amps. So on my battery bank, I could run it all night with no problem. Uh, it's just a large 12 volt heated blanket. A lot of RVers use them as well, and it worked well in here. So here's what I've done for a solar panel or solar array. Now, this is a serviceable solar array. All the plugs are right here. I did build this platform. So here I brought uh, enough wiring out here, like this empty plug right here is for a uh, backup dash cam. Um, so there's a lot of upgrades left to go. But I use these style splitter plugs here, and we actually have 400 watts of solar sitting here. There 200 watt panels, they're five bus bar technology. So what they're doing is instead of having the normal two bus bars, they're a lot more efficient because they actually transmit the power through five bus bars through the system. So they're supposed to be a lot more efficient and a lot more better in low light. Now, because our real estate is so small for this little camper uh, and charging ability, I needed to be able to run a refrigerator that had a compressor in it. I didn't want to use one of those thermal type refrigerators. So my refrigerator literally pulls uh, less than three amps at all times. When, well, not all times, but whenever the compressor is running. So I really needed a decent solar array. So this is what I did because of my battery box. I, um, I'm actually loosely tied in here too. It's not a crazy support structure either. And it's actually worked really well going down the road. As you can see, I can grab this guy and the whole camper moves. So how the thrust structure is for the solar array is whenever the solar panels try to twist in this direction, they are allowed a certain amount of movement here by twisting the pipe. And so that takes the forces that direction. And then these particular pipes on the front are able to bend just a little bit this direction. So it, it's very rugged, but it actually still allows the system to move a little bit. So you can actually hit a curve and all the system will bend a little bit, but it doesn't apply too much force against the camper. Now again, or not again, but the front of my camper is down a little bit. So you can see I actually installed the solar arrays to apply a little bit of a downforce. What that does is that stops oscillation from the wind coming through uh, this area and having a high pressure zone in this area. Uh, it requires and puts a little bit of down pressure on the top of the solar panels. And so far I've actually done 80 miles an hour with it as a test for several hours and not had any kind of oscillation or anything. So if anybody wants to copy this idea, this is actually really lightweight uh, conduit tubing. 
uh, really lightweight stuff if you guys want to see and all I did was just came in here and I came in here with a piece of flat stock and I use a grade 10 or a grade 8 bolt I believe it's a grade 8 grade, grade 10 head bolt for a cylinder for a motor I want to make sure since there's only four mounting points that these get mounted really good and I just literally went through there came up welded the top added a little plate to help with the twist because I actually did have a failure here on our first trip so I had to add these plates because it, it kept bending here and it actually broke out so I added these plates and I've had uh, trouble free miles since then and no more issues I added these little corner marine lights I uh, just added a couple of tabs here to be able to mount it down and uh, that is my solar array just goes right down into the, where the fan is and it's happy as can be Now, if you like my opinion on their kit, on do you choose their fiberglass? Do you just buy the wood? Do you get the complete kit? Uh, what should you use? Now, now, everybody knows this fiberglass has a really strong odor. I've actually used this type of fiberglass in 55 gallon drums to one gallon canisters all the time. And it's pretty rough to deal with and sand with. Uh, oh, if anybody ever wants to know, this is the difference between three ounce. This is the type of uh, fiberglass cloth that is used for making circuit boards for uh, computers and stuff like that. Now here is the six ounce cloth cloth that comes with the kit. Uh, but uh, this, I love this stuff. You can actually bend it really easy. It's a lot more easy to lay down. Two layers of this equals that, and it's more transparent. You can see through it when you're doing your woodwork. Sorry about that. I wanted to talk about that. But I've used this fiberglass before. I've even had lots of experience with this West Marine uh, fiberglass. And I do have to say, by far, this uh, resin that comes with the kit, by far, is the less odorous, greatest stuff to work with. Uh, if you don't actually have any glass in it and you're just sanding this resin itself, it's better for you. Uh, your lungs and stuff like that. I wouldn't say it's 100% better, but I mean, I definitely prefer using their particular system. Now, if you know where to look, you can actually find these guys. I think I paid like $3 for this little jug of it. So if you start to run low on it, if you look in the right places, you can actually uh, find uh, these type of uh, resins fairly cheaply. But if you think that you're going to go with a West Marine or you're going to go with the other fiberglass, it is so expensive that by far the pricing for their kit and what it includes i wasn't able to beat that deal i wasn't able to uh uh compete with that pricing at all so what comes with the kit and the quality of the uh, mat that they send with it i would definitely have to recommend just going with what they send with you uh, it also comes with the wood flower and everything that you would need to uh, uh make that work but that doesn't mean I didn't have problems, though. You see that little window over there? We had a piece of foam up in that window, and my glue station was over there in the corner. So my issue was uh, the epoxy is very temperature sensitive. Well, what happened was the sun came through this window, and we actually had our mixing station over here for a little while. It actually warmed up all the epoxy to uh, pretty much to a point to where the moment we mixed it, it started to kick off in like 20 to 30 minutes. Some batches were even shorter. Well, I was just about to start actually uh, fiberglassing the complete camper, uh, the whole shell at one time. That led to the epoxy kicking off before I could even get it completely done with the shell. It also meant I had a lot of tiny little air bubbles that I couldn't see. In the end, it still led to a lot of uh, frustration trying to get rid of the air bubbles and all that. I also made a mistake uh, when I had to, we are working on two projects as one, at one time when I put the camper outside. Uh, there was a slight uh, threatening of uh, bad weather, so we just simply just threw a black tarp over the top of it. Figured it wouldn't hurt it in a couple hours. But those air bubbles underneath decided to actually uh, pop like pimples. And it also caused the uh, wood to shrink or expand. I'm not 100% sure. But it led to uh, a lot of damage that I actually had to take a small Dremel and uh, grind a lot of these little pit and holes back out. Uh, because my epoxy hardened so quickly, uh, 
it, it just wasn't inevitable. It was my fault, not the fault of, you know, the manufacturer or anything like that. It was my fault for not making sure that my epoxy was at the right temperature before starting um, that whole long event. Now, trying to do it all at once took a long time, and I was more trying to make sure everything was sanded and everything perfect, and so I was ready to go. I've actually done large fiberglass jobs, even longer, larger than that before in my youth uh, days, but uh, that one actually got me. It got me on surprise. Okay, so now that brings me to the drama side of things. Now, if you're like me and don't like drama, uh, just go ahead and end the video here. Uh, but if you're really interested to see how uh, this played out, and you may be concerned of the same issues, um, please go ahead and listen. So like anybody else, I found this little camper by videos uh, on the internet, and I became great interested in it. And it wound up in my little stash of bookmarks for almost a year, maybe a year and a half. Eventually, I told myself uh, with the little one that I wanted to teach her how to do certain things. And so for her, it was basically a shop class and a way to get the family together and to make a trip. My friend who works in the Air Force decided that maybe he might also be interested in as well. So I went ahead and shot the company over an email and told them that I was willing to buy two campers, but if they were willing to take a little bit of the money off for a mold, uh, because each camper comes with a mold, I wouldn't need two of them. I'd only need one. And my friend suggested that if they took enough money off of it to make it worth as well, he would be interested to, to jump in and be able to buy a kit as well. In the end, things didn't work out for my friend because I believe they were willing to take off $100 or $150. Uh, I don't remember. I thought it was a pretty good deal. I could always look back at my emails because I've saved everything. But in the end, I told them that I'd only be choosing a kit uh, for myself. Now, they have shipping of $500. So I told the family, I was like, let's make a vacation out of this. And so we decided to get ready to make a trip to go to Washington, D.C. Now, my little Chevy Volt here gets almost 40 miles of the gallon. So it would take me less than $100 to drive all the way up to Washington, D.C., where their location is, buy this camper, throw it on my little roof rack, and drive home and take the other $400 and turn it into a vacation. I was okay with that. I was willing to do that. Now here's where the communication starts to break down a little bit. Now it is kind of my fault. I probably should have picked up the phone and called him and say, here, I, I was coming. But the, through the same person I was emailing with, I let him know that, hey, I was still interested in the kit. I was leaving on this certain day and it would probably be there in a couple of days. I even emailed them again when I was halfway up. For some reason, I didn't receive any responses. The person may have been on vacation. I don't know. But I actually uh, proceeded to leave. Now, their website suggests that they have tons of kits in stock. Please stop by and see what we have to offer. Also, through the recommendations of other people online and other YouTube videos, it was also suggested that you could easily find some of these kits on sale uh, at particular times at their facility. So, again, I believe that they would possibly at least have one of these kits on stock. To my surprise, after I get there, I found out that these kits are mostly made to order. Now, I did try to give them a chance, and I tried to work with a gentleman. And I was like, well, you know, can you cut me out some of the larger pieces and throw them in a box for me? Because their CNC machine, CNC machine is right there. They're, all of their wood stock is also in the back. Uh, they have a full lumber stock in the rear. So I figured maybe they could help me out and be able to cut some of the shipping costs. But the gentleman I was working with was actually somewhat rude. Another also primary reason why I wanted to go is because a lot of people are actually complaining and talking about how the doors don't stay flush. Now, this is actually a unit that they built themselves. This is inside their shop the day that I was there. Now, if I don't know this particular subject was a sore subject, asking or talking about the door, but there was a recent fix they just kind of released with this, where, again, I talked about earlier, where they use a strap to pull the door into a bow shape, you know, like you were going to shoot bow and arrows. And so I, at the moment I asked him what, what, how to do that, and I wanted to see the door for myself, I wanted to see the camper for myself, and because uh, this is quite a bit of money that you're putting down in an experiment that, you know, can you build one correctly? That seems to be when a lot more things seem to turn sour. And so we left empty-handed. We came all the way home. I actually spent almost a week or two weeks really thinking hard about it, and eventually I went to their, their website, uh, for Google Maps, and I left an honest review, and the actual owner of the company saw it, and he reached out to me, and he actually did a very good job trying to fix and repair what happened. Now, he actually told me this particular gentleman uh, was let go of the company, which I actually very suspectly think not. 
Uh, I remember his face very well, and I know who he is in the company by other videos, but I could be mistaken. Uh, but the, the fix was that he was willing to ship me another kit uh, for free, and then they had a, a sell online which brought the kit from, I think, 25 or 24 down to the 22 that you saw. And so I'm like, okay, I'm willing to give it another try. We invested so much into it already by taking a vacation and making a build-up to go uh, pick up this kit and throw it on the roof of the car and come home and make it. Eventually, we just went ahead with it. And again, I, I'm not regret it at all. I love the little kit. Uh, again, there could be some changes. But all in all, I'm actually pretty satisfied with the kit. And I'm sorry that I had a pretty bad experience. Uh, nowhere on the website do they suggest that uh, at this time or that I know of that these kits are made uh, pre-order. Uh, there are a lot of suggestions that come on down and, you know, we got all kinds of stuff on sale and we have kits, uh, just pick up a kit. Uh, most of it is their kayak kits. So with that being said, uh, there's not really much left to add to it. Now, also, uh, why is it such a big deal for this leading edge of this door to be flush? Well, now that I have about 20,000 miles on this little camper, something like that, uh, we have quite a few fairly large trips on it, there is a lot of rock chip damage that I've had to deal with on the front of this camper. Now, because this is a laminated uh, marine plywood, if you should happen to get a rock come up and hit the leading edge of that door, and let's say you're, you, you're trying to keep the wood finished here, your door is not painted, any kind of moisture, any kind of water or weather that gets into wherever that chip is will now start to cause water damage and discolorization in the wood. And the moment that stands out on the side of that camper, you've just ruined that whole camper uh, and the look of that camper by just a small little bit of damage. So it's very important to try to get that leading edge tucked in as best you can so nothing can come up and smack it. Gracie, what did you just do again? Do it again. Lovely fiberglass. <laughs> <laughs> how many times have you done that already? Like the fourth time I did that. And how well is that working for you? Come on, try to blow on it again. Wow, I think I saw some move. You want to see some move? Uh.